The plans for the space shuttle program were hatched when uh, NASA was still doing the Apollo program. We're about in the middle of the Apollo program, and NASA decided that uh, they really need to start thinking about the next step because they knew that there would only be a limited number of the of the Apollo missions to go. Uh, and they started thinking about you know what the next thing would be, uh, and they decided to you know to think big. So they decided they you know one that would have a lot of characteristics of an airplane yet still be able to go into space. And that's how they figured out, uh, you know, after a period of time, uh, how they wanted to architect the space shuttle. There were a lot of people interested in, in, the, in the program, and the Department of Defense was a, a big participant at the time. They really drove a lot of the design. They really wanted a vehicle that uh, had substantial stay time on orbit, and one that could also have a lot of cross range on landing, because they wanted to be able to land at a, at a variety of sites around the globe. There was this uh, mission imagined that when they would launch out of the Vandenberg Air Force Base to deploy satellites over the Soviet Union, they would want to be able to launch and return within one orbit so that the orbiter with the crew would never fly over the Soviet Union, but the payload could be released. Um, in retrospect, it seems kind of foolish that you could actually fly a mission that would last one orbit and be able to open a payload bay and get the payload out and close it. but. Driven by that mission, the shuttle had to be able to return to Vandenberg Air Force Base after just one orbit, and the Earth would have rotated 1,500 miles under you. So it needed a 1,500-mile cross range to steer the entry path from orbit back to Vandenberg. Uh, that meant they needed pretty high lift at uh, high Mach numbers, and uh, they uh, designed, they had to go to a double delta wing uh, the Air Force decided that they were going to drop out of the program, and so you know, by that time the design was set, and it was kind of too late to go back. But the the program I went forward with the with the design that really met all the all the Air Force's requirements. Uh, Draper got involved uh, because uh, basically we were the guys from Apollo, right? We did all the guidance, navigation, and control, and software, and and software was a very new thing, and and NASA really wanted us and our expertise involved. And I actually came to the laboratory in 1974, anticipating this work would be in-house. But in the interim, NASA had decided to go with the prime contract uh, model, and Rockwell won the entire contract, including what Draper would have done. So as originally envisioned, Draper's role would actually be fairly small, uh, more of an advisory capacity. Uh, but over time, uh, NASA began to get more and more nervous about this idea of letting the contractors do everything and uh, st our role started to increase. Uh, by the time the program started, uh, we were intimately involved in, in all aspects of guidance, navigation, and control for the ascent, on-orbit, and entry phases, and uh, had a really heavy role defining all the, the detailed software specifications. IBM was given the job of actually writing the software because in those days, it was thought that only a powerhouse like IBM could really handle such a big job. And they ended up doing a very good job, but uh, it was a intimately, there was an intimate interaction between what Draper did and what, what IBM did. We developed the flow charts, which were the requirements. We didn't do the actual coding, but we did lay out, here's how the code should operate, here's the modes we wanted, here's the structure we wanted, you know, and then if you, here's the branch if something happens, if something else happens, you go down this branch. IBM was doing the coding. They took the flowcharts, translated it into uh, word statements. You know, if this, then do this. And they coded it essentially exactly the way that we wanted them to code it. One of the really unique things, and the th one of the things that made the program really work, is that uh, we had a really good simulation of the, of the vehicle. We called it an integrated simulation. So the way we actually wrote the software is, the back is backwards the way you would do it today. We actually you know, wrote up the algorithms basically um, almost on a chalkboard, uh, then coded them very quickly, tested them out, tweaked them and massaged them to make sure they all worked properly, got them to run the simulation, and only then do we then document what the software was. So that you know, we already knew by the time that we had delivered the software, the, the software description documents, they were called FISRs, Functional Software System Specifications. By the time we delivered those to IBM, we knew that they worked because they, they ran well on our sims. Since the shuttle was a, a very um, bigger craft and it had a, a more uh, extensive control system, if you will, instead of just the conical you know, command module or the LEM, um, we really had to get 
or integrated simulations up to speed, very high fidelity. And we did that with uh, models of the shuttle. We had a nice uh, simulation group here. It was separate from the ones that developed the models and those of us who were doing the analysis. Uh, this was a transitional period for Draper uh, in terms of computing. Uh, when I started work uh, in 76, we were still using pay, uh, cards uh, for, uh, uh, for the code. And, um, you know, that was, uh, that was still the norm, I guess, in industry. Um, and then we switched over to, uh, uh, to file-based uh, system. But the running of, of simulations would take uh, multiple hours. Uh, so we, um, you know, we would do simulations um, and overnight. Um, a lot of times there would be a problem. I would check on them from home and ask the operator, um, how big is the stack of paper? <laughs> <laughs> if it was small, uh, you know, I knew there was something wrong because we were expecting stacks that were on the order of feet. <laughs> Luckily, I was uh, living across the river at the time, so I would uh, come over here and, and fix the problem and then submit it again and uh, make sure it was ready for people to analyze it you know, the next day. But what NASA wanted to do for the shuttle is they formed mode teams, which means we were part of a team with some other contractors that worked for NASA. But most of our designs, especially in the rendezvous area, um, the targeting area, were taken as the MO team decided that was the best way to go. We were working kind of for two groups down there. One was the mission planning group, which uh, one of the gentlemen there, uh, Ed Lineberry, had developed a stable orbit rendezvous concept, which was more heavily ground involved. In other words, the ground would give you the solutions until you got real close, and then we'd go on board relative uh, navigation. And uh, another group down there, which was more the integration group, which that did the crew training, wanted to do the old concentric flight plan because that was a very measured approach. You know, you come up with small altitude differences between you and the target and, and then rendezvous. So we were, we were like the arbiter or arbitrator, if you want to call it, between the concentric flight plan and stable orbit rendezvous. We'd go down one week and we'd make a presentation on a Tuesday to the group that wanted the, uh, the uh, concentric flight plan. We'd say we need to modify it for, you know, shuttle to do this and this. Then the day later, we'd go down and we'd speak to the other group saying, well, if you want to use stable orbit, here's what you need to do. Add some mid-courses, blah, 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 and all that. So it was a very um, interesting tightrope that we were walking. And I remember before they made the final decision, we, the laboratory, had to make a presentation at the flight techniques meeting. And uh, they asked us for our recommendation. We presented data on both the concentric and also on the stable orbit. And then um, we told them it was technically you can make either one work. The shuttle could support either one. And then the crew came in, it was John Young, I believe it was, who came in and said, we would like to try the stable orbit rendezvous, with the caveat that we could change back to the concentric if we, if we decide we want to do that. Well, of course you knew that once the stable orbit was decided, if it worked successfully, which we, you really kind of feel comfortable, you know it's going to work, because you've done all the analysis and based on all your previous Apollo experience and shuttle work, you knew it was going to work and you knew they'd never come back to the concentric flight plan there were a lot of rendezvous for the shuttle. And again, what the lab brought to it was we could integrate you know, flight control, navigation, you know, guidance and targeting into a coherent system look at what we needed to do. And it stood us in good stead all the way through the shuttle, um, even through to the point where um, you know, the remote manipulator system, uh, even after the shuttle, <laughs> the shuttle rendezvous, which it was very interesting, the shuttle rendezvous system, the navigation and the targeting, was so um, robust and so good from the beginning that we didn't change it. After the first rendezvous, it didn't change. But as you can imagine, if you're picking up different satellites, you had to tweak the control system, some of the control algorithms all, all along. So they worked the control a long time into, uh, into the shuttle program, you know, because we had, a, as I say, refined stuff for picking up satellites in different centers of mass and CG locations and stuff. But the rendezvous system was dead on from the beginning. There were no changes made to it, except to add better displays and also to uh, maybe do some relative uh, displays closer so that the crew could get an aid rather than having to look out the window. So we had a simulation. Uh, we had the uh, guidance algorithms coded in HAL-S and NASA uh, decided to, uh, uh, that they needed a backup system. 
and it seemed reasonable to them and us to, uh, to come to Draper to take the system that we had and, um, and turn it into flight quality code. The backup system uh, was developed uh, just in case there was a software problem or you know, something generically wrong with the primary system. The primary system was that there was a uh, manual backup, a manual mode to, uh, to the ascent. For the backup, they said, yeah, we don't need the manual mode, we'll just do automatic. For uh, reentry, um, there was both automatic and manual. In that case, they said, uh, we'll just do manual. So, uh, so we had to test manual mode. And again, since we're running with, uh, uh, at Draper, we were just running non-real time on a mainframe computer, uh, taking hours to <laughs> get run. Uh, we couldn't run in uh, real time with a human in the loop. So we had to develop a, um, a model of an astronaut. And a gentleman here at the laboratory, Don Isles, uh, invented this language, what he called, we call a timeliner. But what it allowed us to do, because I was the head of the integration group at that time, it allowed us to really simulate crew actions. You could read a display because everything that we did on a shuttle, you know, we were driving displays so we could tell the crew exactly what they would see. You expect, um, say, residuals in a navigation system to start off high and come down. Here's what it looks like if it doesn't, you got a problem, all that kind of stuff. So what he allowed us to, what that language allowed us to do was to simulate a crew looking at a display, a certain line, and take action. And until that uh, piece of software was developed, we couldn't do that. Well, that means now we could fly the shuttle in, we could fly automatic, you know, rendezvous, auto, all the way down to docking and the docking port. Now, we had developed this language as, as part of our, really our simulations for the, uh, for the space shuttle. We needed a way to emulate what the crew did, and so we, Don Isles, developed this language called Timeliner uh, that uh, could uh, be able to act as a crew would act. So if this happened, do that, and when this happens, do this, and that's the kind of command you put in, and, and so you're essentially acting as if you're giving instructions to the pilot, and so this acted sort of like a pseudo-pilot for, for our simulation, uh, and we're able to turn that into a you know, a rather sophisticated uh, automation language that was used to automate all of the uh, payload activities on the, on the space station. If you do the job right and you, and you show that, you know, over missions, whether it's Apollo or shuttle, that you're getting the answers and it's confirmed by real flight data, you know, you can take a look at a post-flight, then people have a real uh, good grasp that you're, you're telling them the truth, you give them the good technical answers, and that goes a long way to, number one, establishing the laboratories reputation, but it also to make a project work properly. There was a, a, lot, you know, a lot that could have gone wrong and everything had to go right. And that's the kind of the, uh, the good and the bad about space flight is that, you know, it, it, yeah, things have to be perfect or things can go very wrong. And so it, um, luckily it all, it all went right. And, uh, and if you remember, you may have seen the footage, uh, when the crew landed, there were you know, no two happier guys on the planet than those two guys who were walking around, punching their fists in the air, and real excited that they survived uh, the, the first shuttle flight. You felt, at least from, from me, I felt that, that we had done our work. And unless some catastrophic happened like it did with the O-rings, that our systems were going to work fine. When I say ours, I mean NASA's and ours and the rest of the contractor systems. It's just, it's a feeling you get, I think, when you have a real good team working the stuff and you've really gone down into the details.